all that from the angle of how it helps people have better experiences with products and software and services. Uh, I'm also a sort of a geek for lo-fi methods and tips and tricks, which you'll be seeing a lot of in this presentation. Uh, and Adaptive Path, if you're not familiar with us, we're a user experience consulting firm in San Francisco. We do uh, product and service design, usually for things that have screens in them. And we do a lot of user research in support of that. And we do a lot of events and training, and we do a lot of talking. I like to share ideas. There's a lot of blah, blah, blah. But it's, it's good, blah, blah, blah. So that's where I am now. But before all of this, uh, before I came to Adaptive Path, I worked at a company called Barclays Global Investors which is a financial services firm also based in San Francisco. And at Barclays Global Investors, I was a true user experience team of one. I did all of these things. I was this person who had all these hats that I wore. And it was fun. Uh, I got to do a lot of different things. People really liked working with me. It was this really interesting linchpin role between business and tech, and I thought it was really fun to be there. And I was in this process that seems to work pretty well, where I'd work with business partners, I'd work with project managers and business analysts and stakeholders, and I'd, they'd help me understand the requirements that they had, and then I'd take all these requirements in the form of spreadsheets and PowerPoint documents and Word documents, and then I'd run them through the mill of user experience design, and out would come wireframes or comps or something that I could hand off to the development team to be implemented, and that was awesome. Everyone's pretty happy with that. Except that, from time to time, or let's be honest, most of the time, actually, um, there was something about what was being produced that was sort of less than optimal. There were good moments, sure. There was stuff in the software that I was making and in the websites that I was making that was sort of like better than what was there before. But there was a lot that was still kind of funky, and a lot that didn't feel like it actually delivered on all the promise of what we thought we were buying when we earmarked a lot of money for these projects. And when that happened, I would fight like mad to argue that I had gotten the wrong requirements. And the people who gave me all the stuff that I was working from were wrong. It was over-specified, or it was under-specified, or it was just plain wrong. And we needed to fix the requirements process if we were going to fix our products. Or, alternately, I said that the developers, ah, oh, much as they were well-meaning, they had failed to implement on the vision that I had in my head. And in all of this, I was holy because I represented the user. <laughs> it's the good fight, right? Like we come in and we know that we're on the right side of things. So even if they don't get it, the reason they don't get it, that's their problem. We're coming in for the users, and that's what really matters. Well, this is a slight tangent, but I just came across this recently and it seemed kind of interesting to me. Um, Forrester has this customer experience model for the stages of evolution of, of customer experience in an organization. They use customer experience, I use user experience, I think it's the same thing. But basically, any company will go through these five stages until they get to the point at which they really get user experience. The first stage, right up here, is when they're interested in it. They talk about it, they think it's cool, they send around links about, you know, from the Harvard Business Review about good user experience. And um, they're curious, but they haven't made any real commitment to it yet. Um, the second stage, stage two, is when they start to get invested. And that means that there's some person who has some responsibility for something related to user experience. And there might be some projects with an aspect of user experience in them. Stage three is when a company really gets committed. And that means that they have VP support for user experience. So somebody with some real agency in the company actually has accountability for that. Stage four is when it's so engaged that it becomes uh, part of sort of top line initiatives, and everybody knows they're working towards user experience goals at sort of a broad level. And stage five is when it becomes fully embedded, so so much a fabric of the company that it's not even necessary to talk about it explicitly because it's in everything we do. And I think Tony said yesterday it was a perfect example of somebody who embeds user experience or customer experience in every fiber of this organization. Um, Virgin is a great example of this. Also, Zipcar, there are lots of good examples out there. The thing that interests me about this model, and about my story, frankly, is that the real distribution looks like this. Hmm. Lots of people are interested, some of them are finally getting invested, and then it takes so long, and there's so precious few that actually make it up to here, that mostly we're all still clustered down here. And I actually think that this stage two is kind of a sticking point that makes it sort of hard for user experience to advance uh, as far as it could. And by this I mean, when I was at Barclays Global Investors, it was a stage two company because they had invested 
in me because they paid my salary, and I was doing projects that had a user experience component to them, but I had no real authority and no real agency, and so what I would do is I would spend a lot of time concocting defenses for the designs that I was making, and it, frankly, it gets a little annoying after a while. I was at a conference recently and somebody said, he said, I asked how like, it was going with the new user experience people in their company, and he said, it's great, they're doing a lot of good work, but we've got to keep them in line. It's like, ah, it's so maddening to hear that, but you realize that the reason that, that, perspective, that perspective exists, and I think it exists a lot more broadly than we realize, is that people at stage two who do user experience work are frustrated, they don't necessarily have the support they need, and so they just end up being kind of like a nudge or a thorn in the side, and they, and they irritate people in the company, which can make it harder to get to three, four, and five. So that's what I was experiencing at Barclays Global Investors. And that's why I decided after a while that surely there was something more professionally satisfying than just trying to erode the confidence of business analysts and developers. So I decided to go somewhere where I could learn how you become a stage three, a stage four, or a stage five company. And that's when I went to Barclays Second Path, which is a great company. I was super excited and so happy to join. I have a great reputation for doing this kind of work. And um, my very first day when I went in to do work, uh, working on a project with some colleagues, and I walked into the room, and they said, okay, let's get designing. And they handed me paper and a pen and said, all right, start turning it out. And it put the fear of God in me. It was so terrifying because my process for designing up until this moment had been to um, take my requirements, retreat into my cubicle, put on my headphones, and then sort of push pixels for days and days and days, and then come out and do this dog and pony show with all these sort of predetermined arguments for why what I was proposing was the right design. And this was something totally different. This was people asking me to show my work, to have more ideas than just one, to be flexible in in letting go of the things that I was sort of interested in as ideas and, and having more you know, different, different ones, new ones. So it was, it was needless to say, uh, a new experience for me. But what was cool about it was I was working with two other colleagues and we were all doing it together. And really quickly, you started to see that working in this um, kind of lightweight, uh, collaborative way, we came up with a lot of ideas for a particular design problem really quickly. Uh, and they were all, I mean, this wasn't different ideas for different parts of the system. This was a million different ideas for the home page or a million different ideas for sign-on. Things that you wouldn't necessarily think have a lot of different possible solutions to them. What happened after I started working in this way was I discovered that I was doing work differently even on my own. I was starting to take more time to uh, force myself to have six ideas before I allowed myself to move forward with one of those ideas. And it got me really interested in, in the whole sort of design process, which frankly I had not been trained in. I have a library science degree. I can tell you about uh, browsing and searching until the cows come home, but really how the design process works was not something that I had been trained with. And what I learned when I started looking into this was that there's actually a proud tradition in this kind of thinking. And the logic goes like this. To get to this, to get to a wireframe or whatever, an idea for what the endpoint is, you don't start at the end point. You start at the beginning with one idea, and then you go wide. You generate a lot of ideas, you do a very sort of divergent activity that gives you more ideas, and more ideas, and more ideas. And then when you've got a lot to work with, you reach this sort of critical point where you just realize we're at capacity. There are probably more ideas out there, but we can't use them. So then you turn a corner, and then you refine the ideas. And in the process of generating and refining, some things have more tooth. You just realize you're good. And you evolve them a little bit, and you mix them with other ideas. And little by little, you get to the end point where the one idea that is maybe not the only possible idea, but the one that you're going to go forward with starts to emerge. So this is the generative design process, and it, it was sort of so interesting to me as a really uh, kind of well-articulated um, method for coming up with pretty amazing ideas that I, I decided that I wanted to share with other people. And that is my goal for today, basically. My goal for today is to give you really lightweight tips and tricks that are realistic that you can use to design like that, to design a generative, broad, blossoming prospect that brings you to something that really is meaningful to you, whether you are a team of one, or a team of two, or a team of three. 
So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to talk about three sort of big ideas, with techniques in each of them. Um, the first, which is something I sort of just alluded to, is brainstorming a lot. Um, brainstorming is sort of such a meaningless word. I use it a lot, but I actually think that there are some very uh, concrete techniques that you can use to brainstorm, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm also going to talk about assembly and ad hoc team. And this is the idea that even if you are the only person in your company or in your group who thinks about user experience, odds are you do work with other people, and they do have ideas about what the product should be and opinions about that stuff. And you can use them. And then list them, you can harvest their brains to help you in the design process. So I'm going to show you how to do that. And then the third step is about how to pick the best ideas. And that's, that's saying that once you've done all this work to really go wide, you do have to sort of articulate to yourself and to others why you've picked a particular direction to go with. And this is how you do it. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to use an example. This is Invite. How many of you guys have used Evite? Yes. Uh, I love Evite, and I use Evite all at the same time. Um, an adaptive path sometimes can talk about dream projects or like products that we use in our own lives that if they were better designed, would make our own lives better. Evite is one of those, those projects. So um, with apologies and respects to Evite, who are good friends, we like them very much. Um, that's the example I'm going to use to show some of these techniques. So um, let's take a look at Evite. Uh, incidentally, uh, since I first put this presentation together, they've made some some changes, so they've been working on good stuff. But this is sort of what we started with. So the the process starts, and it's a little probably small in the back, but um, I'll talk you through it. The process starts with this place where you see a design gallery, and you pick an evite from some of these examples, or you can sort of pick a type of event from the left, and then you go into this place where you configure your invitation. And you give it background, and you give it some name, and you fill out all the information, and you can sort of make it as custom as you want, or as generic as you want. And then, finally, you go into this step where you invite people, and maybe you import them from your address book, or maybe you fill it out, and you send them the email, and voila, have a party. Well, let's say your job was to redesign eBite. What would you do? Well. You do, you do good due diligence, right? You would talk to stakeholders, you do use the research, you'd get all this sort of input, but then when it came right down to it, you'd also have to figure out like what's not working in this process. And I think there are some things you could see, maybe off offhand, that would that would lead to some ideas. Like this is a three-step process, and maybe a three-step process is, is you know is longer than a two-step process or a one-step process, so maybe you could streamline a little bit. Uh, it looks a little bit inconsistent, so maybe there's some visual coherence you could bring to the design. Uh, or you could argue that maybe there are some points where there are these sort of rabbit holes where you can spend a lot of time getting lost in the interaction and maybe there's opportunities to fix that. Those are all good ideas, but frankly, why are those any better than any other ideas and, and, and what are the opportunities that are, are, are latent in this, are sort of hidden under the surface? Ultimately, it's kind of still this problem. You're starting from the beginning. So what do you do? You brainstorm a lot. and. Um, Here's, again, just to beat the dead horse, how I used to work when I needed to brainstorm. I'd go to my computer, I'd sort of fire it up, I'd get ready to start making me one design, one wireframe. That was a solution to the problem. And um, we're not doing that anymore. It doesn't work. What we're going to do instead is use this tool, which is a paper template that we use a lot at Adaptive Path. It's called the 6up template. And it's called 6up because it has six little thumbnail-sized screen sketches. And you fill it in. This is what the actual 6 up template looks like. Uh, and if you're interested, I'll be talking about a couple of different templates in this presentation. Uh, talk to me afterwards, I can send them to you. So the point of the 6 up template is this. When you first start brainstorming, you're going to come up with one idea, or maybe two. And um, they'll probably be informed by tools that you already use, and, or else some design that you recently did. And that's awesome. You should do that and you should put them down, but then um, you're probably going to hit a wall at some point, and when you hit a wall, your responsibility as the user experience team of one is to force yourself to move past the wall, to have more ideas than just the two ideas. And what's beautiful about the 6-up template is you still have all of these boxes that you feel compelled to fill in. So your job is to get from one to two, 
to 3, 4, 5, and 6. And, and that's it, basically. You just need to start getting a lot of different ideas. I'm going to show you some techniques for sort of structuring those ideas in a second, but before I even do that, I will say the 6-up template is just a construct. You actually need to be making lots of 6-up templates and doing tons and tons of them. So don't limit yourself to 6, but think, think in this way. So, all right, so let's say you're, you're at, you've made one idea, you have another idea, you hit the wall. How do you move past the wall? Well, for me, I find that using um, conceptual frameworks is one really great way to start brainstorming past the wall. And the idea of conceptual frameworks is just that it's some structure that you can use to start to give constraints to the way that you're thinking about design possibilities. These are just three examples. This is by no means exhaustive, of course, but these are just a couple that I find that I use a lot. So let's look at an example of using a conceptual framework of how you move past the wall. So let's take spectrums. A spectrum is pretty basic, just one sort of dimension of the design that you're trying to produce. And it gives you sort of places along the dimension to put ideas in. So let's say that for Evite, I, what I was interested in is sort of familiarity with the system. This is a dimension that I kind of want to explore in, in understanding what our options are. So if we have sort of the first time user on one end and the expert user on the other, let's think about what some screen designs might look like. Well, let's say you're a first timer. I think for you, if you're a first timer, what's probably pretty important is a pretty comfortable sort of welcome message, some good descriptive text, some good sort of comfortable imagery, and then it's the juicy, let's get started button. So that's a possible design for a first timer. What about somebody who's a bit more in the middle? Maybe you want to have the ability to sort of be guided in that first time scenario, but maybe there are some people who've been there before and are a little more production oriented and they just want to jump right in and pick a template. Or maybe the expert experience is this awesome productivity version of Evite where you have like a database dump and all the Evites you've ever created and the status, how who's read them and who hasn't read them, and you can create a new one right there. We're not at the point yet where we actually care if any of these are the right design. We're just trying to understand what some different possibilities are. And if you look at these things, these three different designs, you can see just in my really rough little thumbnail sketch that they have very different um, like affordances and sort of suggestions for what the experience of using them would be as an end user. Um, another good conceptual uh, framework is the 2 by 2 which is basically just a spectrum on top of a spectrum. And where this is going, you can sort of play with the intersections. So we'll still use first timer and expert, but let's say we're actually interested in understanding the possibilities for a very manual system versus a very automatic system. So over here, let's say in the first timer and manual category, this could be an option for how you start in the light. So you've got your sort of, it's a structured kind of process, and it still has some pretty friendly, big, easy to use buttons. Pick layout, add stuff, make it fun. But you can dip right in from any of these steps into the manual configuration process. Or let's say that you want a first timer or automatic kind of experience for Evite. And maybe this is like big friendly question at the top and then certain types of Evites you can sort of jump right into and then you can kind of uh, customize from there. This incidentally is very similar to what we saw in the screenshot from their site. So it gives you a clue to the type of experience they're actually trying to design for. The automatic expert experience, maybe this is like a crazy form configurator, it's like you pick your layout and then you invite your people and then you tick off the other options and you go and poof, that comes the perfect invite for you. Or in the manual expert experience, maybe this is the super cool web 2.0 uh, like evite like in-page modifier thing. Um, again, in all of these cases, totally different uh, sort of experiences are being suggested. But a really light, quick thumbnail sketch is enough to give me uh, ideas for what I have in mind and probably to start to convey some of this to other people. So uh, a grid, very similar to a 2 by 2 on the spectrum, it just gives you a place to sort of play with dimensions. Um, but the cool thing about the grid is that it's, you can also just pick kind of arbitrary attributes that you might want to explore a little bit. So what if the experience is all about friends? What does an interface like that look like? Or what if actually um, designing the most gorgeous e you ever saw is the thing that is the most important in the application? And then playing with those dimensions, you can brainstorm, brainstorm accordingly. So I encourage you to think about other conceptual frameworks that would be interesting to you, but, but these are really easy ones to, to start with right away. Um, Word associations is another really simple kind of tool that I use to come up with uh, possibilities. We use 
keywords, consciously and otherwise, all the time, actually, to pull, pull up a whole kind of host of associations and ideas that are stored in our head. And the idea here is that you just make it more explicit, actually, by, by playing with them, by picking and choosing and figuring out kind of what you can make with chocolate and peanut butter. So this is a list of words that just came from Welly.com, like a, you know, a, a pattern library on the web. But these are words that we often use in the work we do, right? So what happens if I randomly pick a couple of words from this list? Let's do that. So okay, I picked modules and icons. Um, not two words that necessarily would be relevant in my exercise to redesign e -bite, but it's fun to think about what I could come up with that. So using modules and, and icons, this is what I came up with. Um, so you've got these very modular, iconographic kind of objects that you can drag into the workspace for creating your eBay and then customize from there. Um, again, we don't know yet if this is the right design for them, but it sure as hell is pretty different from what I was coming up with when I was first designing home pages for eBay. Um, and you can imagine that you can sort of play with different modes, add infinite, and come up with lots of different ideas. Another thing I use uh, for brainstorming is an inspiration library. And this is probably pretty elementary. I would guess a lot of you do this already, but it's so, so critical to my work that I felt like I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Um, what I do is I use uh, the screen grab plugin for Firefox, which just lets you take a, like, right click and take a full screenshot of any web page. And as I'm going on the web, you know, doing, sort of conducting my life, I'll just take screenshots of things that are interesting to me, and then I drag them into iPhoto, and then I basically have this visual database of inspiration whenever I'm sort of starting from a new problem. Um, and the inspiration library is super helpful for kind of analysis and stuff like that, but it's even more helpful for simply finding visual structural patterns that can inspire you a little bit to think differently. So I did this, I went through my inspiration library, and I saw Box, which I thought was fun. I liked a lot of pieces of it. I liked this kind of um, structured but simple, kind of fun sort of overview of what the system is all about. I really like this big uh, sort of photo space that felt like if you could use it in a slightly marketing way without it feeling like a banner ad, I liked tag cloud. There were some things I liked about it. So using that as inspiration, and we use the word inspiration, not stealing, using that as inspiration, I thought, what can I do with eBay? And here's what I came up with. So very structured kind of process. Uh, or structured kind of overview of what's in the system at the top. Create an e-bike, organize an event, talk. Uh, a place to sort of highlight e-bikes that we love, things that maybe you as users of the system have created. Uh, and then maybe a place for sort of, uh, sort of relevant tagging kind of events kind of uh, display. Again, these are in totally different industries. They have no relationship to each other. But just finding some interesting visual structures helped me to start to think about different ways to treat the e-bike experience. So those are general ideas for how you can brainstorm a lot. But I actually don't think it's sufficient to brainstorm on your own. I think it's a little bit negligent, in fact, to brainstorm on your own. That is what I was doing at Barclays Global Investors, and it's what I think made me frustrated in the end. So I think the real power, the real dynamic power of this stuff is when you can get other people involved. So what do I mean by that? I mean invite the project managers that you work with to help you come up with design ideas. Invite the developers, who sure as hell have a lot of ideas for what the system should be, to participate in the creation of those design ideas. And everybody else who has any stake in it, invite them to help you come up with those ideas. Here are some activities you can do to make that easier, because I think it's helpful when it's a structure for that conversation. So um, one thing you can do is you can use sketch boards. Um, who's heard of sketch boards? A few of you. This is sort of an idea that we locked into at an epic path. Actually, after we were doing all that sketching um, and brainstorming that I was just showing you, we had this problem, which was that we needed to bring all these loose sketches to a client's office, and there was no way to do it. So we basically just got a big piece of butcher paper and started sort of taping it up and gave it a little bit of structure. And lo and behold, we had this like mood board for interaction design, which was a very fun thing to look at. Um, this incidentally has been described as a new buzzword for a blatantly obvious technique by a guy on Delicious, which is awesome. It should be obvious, actually. It should be simple. Um, but the cool thing about the sketch board is not even just the display factor. It's what happens when you start talking somebody through it and invite a group of people to participate in that conversation. Because it becomes uh, a canvas for you to evolve the ideas together with. Um, 
So what will happen is, because it's big, because you're all standing up, because you're all crowded around, the visual affordances, not the visual, the, the physical, the physical kind of uh, situation that you're all in will be more dynamic and energetic, and people will start pointing at things, and they'll start saying, that thing, it doesn't really, it's not that thing you drew over there, it's not exactly what I was thinking of for this spot, but it would look really cool in that spot. And it creates this sort of visual vocabulary that everybody can use together to have a conversation about the design. Um, here's a little video of how to make a sketch board. There's no audio, it's just a couple minutes. So you start with a big sheet of paper, about that big. You give it some structure, you put um, like personas and requirements and all your inputs on one side, you give it some space for your sketches. Again, you put up the kind of criteria that inform what you were sketching. Then, you do your sketching. You start putting it up in the structure that you created. And it includes your your six-up sketches, it can also include larger sort of full-page sketches that you take further into this. It can include inspiration from other websites that just seems relevant. And you give it the right structure and you put it all together. And then you take it off the wall, you roll it up, you take it where the folks are. And then you go in this meeting, and you put it on the wall, and you talk with everybody about it, and you invite them to draw all over it, and draw other things on top of it. And you're going to come back, and you'll have this thing that looks like marked up. There's a lot of like annotations on it and other ideas. And you review that stuff, and then that stuff, not your original sketches, the ideas, the annotations, the extra sketches on top, that's what you take into the sort of next phase of design. Because that's, that's a good... Um, it's a good sort of team-based design that is not team, we're not designed by committee. Um, so sketchboards, they're fun, use those. Um, another thing you can do, if you actually want to not just get uh, other folks on the team involved in the review process, but get them involved in the idea generation process, is to host an open design session. Uh, open design sessions are something you do a lot at Adaptive Path. It's basically um, an hour when you invite everybody, ev literally everybody you want, to come in and help you design solutions to a problem. And um, you give them, you, they, you bring them in, you tell them what the problem is, you give them some paper and some pen, and then you just spend some time coming up with ideas. And um, I believe that pizza is actually important because it has to sort of be fun and a little bit playful. Um, if you invite people to come in at 9 a.m. and do this, you will just not get the same quality of ideas that you'll get in a slightly less kind of formal environment. Uh, if you find that uh, people need a little more structure, but you still kind of want them to be giving you their ideas, using templates in this kind of an environment can be really helpful. So um, these are three different templates that we use a lot. Uh, again, if you're interested, talk to me afterwards, I can give you copies of them. Um, this is a concept sheet template. It's really basic. It just gives you a place for a title, naming the idea, and a place to draw a picture of it. Uh, and that picture can look like a user interface sketch, it can look like a system diagram, it can look like a stick person holding a flower, it can be anything really. Um, and then a place to just write a little bit about what it's like and what it does, and ask people to fill that stuff in. And it will give you a lot of little idea seedlings to take back and to make it to idea plants, flowers, etc. Um, the design in the box template is uh, something I first learned about from Jess McMullen at a company called Inform in Canada. Uh, it's basically um, an exercise where you take your product, whatever it is, and you envision what the physical packaging on the shelf for that product would look like. Particularly if it's one that doesn't ship in a product, in a box. That can be a very illuminating exercise because it, it sort of forces you to articulate what would cause a user to pull your product off the shelf uh, instead of your competitors sitting right next to it. Which is essentially what they're doing when they're using your website anyway, so it's, I think it's, it externalizes that thought process a little bit. So on the front you say like, what are the core values of this product, or what, or what are, what's like the selling point of this product? On the back you talk about the features that are really important. It's, it's a very interesting exercise. Um, the third is the design the experience template, which is a little bit more abstract and language based, but super helpful. You basically take, you ask people to write down objects, nouns, and adjectives for the experience that you want your system to provide, and um, the objects or objects, verbs, verbs, nouns, and adjectives. Um, the verbs end up actually corresponding really well to uh, actions and activities that you, people want to take in the system. Nouns end up being actors and sort of elements of the system. 
and adjectives end up being more uh, sort of uh, kind of uh, abstract kind of experience things that you kind of wanted to design for. And again, there's a place to draw a picture. But I mean, it doesn't really matter what template you use. I think the key is giving people enough structure to start to um, to externalize their their ideas and share them with you. Uh, and even if you don't have time to invite people into a conference room, even if you don't have a conference room, I think that you can still get a lot of benefit by just putting your ideas up on the walls around you while they're in progress, not when they're done. Um, because what it does is people walk by and they see what's going on and they get curious and they ask you about it. And that accomplishes two things. It helps them to understand what the hell you do, frankly, which a lot of them don't. Uh, and it also invites them into the process really early on in a way that makes them participants and supporters of it as opposed to recipients of it at the end point. This is something that I did not do ever at Barclays Global Investors. I did not want to show the sausage. And I robbed myself of a really amazing opportunity to have supporters built in early on who wanted to help me move my ideas through the organization. So do that. Decorate your space. Uh, all of this stuff Oh, yes, a tip. Okay, so sometimes people are, it's hard for people. Sometimes people are just not used to actually being uh, invited into this kind of process in this way. So you need uh, to, to pull it out of them sometimes. So one tip that I recommend is simply passing the pen. Uh, especially in things like the sketch, in the sketchboard session, if you will find, and you may have already found in your life, that people will say to you, um, what, if, what if we did something like this? And they'll start describing things verbally that are interface descriptions. And what they're doing is they're trying to paint a picture with their words. And that's difficult because then when you interpret that visually later on, there's always a layer of abstraction and interpretation. So just ask them to show you. Just give them the pen. Encourage them. Embolden them to use the pen. Um, the uh, other thing that can be really helpful, if people don't quite know what to, to give feedback on, which I think is a common problem when you're sharing some of this really loose, kind of raw ideas, um, is to refer back to the things that we agreed upon early on. So if we had this requirements definition document, and I'm showing you these crazy rough sketches now, what, which of these sketches feel like they most, most sort of closely support the ideas that we went in with in the beginning? And which don't? And what's the trade-off? And why is that a problem? And why is that good? Give people things to anchor their feedback to. Uh, and another thing you can do, which is actually really fun, is have a black hat session. If this is actually great if you have people who are sort of quiet browsers about, or loud browsers about your project. Um, often there will be people who really want to support you, uh, and they may have things that they're worried about they don't want to tell you because they don't want to hurt your feelings. And ultimately you may have people who are really unsupportive, and they're constantly sort of just like pestering you about this one thing that seems like, oh my god, would you shut up about that already? But the thing is, they don't feel heard yet. So a black hat session is great for both those kinds of people and for everyone in between. Um, you invite everybody into a room, and you give it a fixed period of time, like a half an hour or an hour, and you play this little make-believe game where everybody has to be the black-hatted villain and pretend that they want to poke as many holes in the, the project as possible, and they have to um, spend time going through the designs and identifying every objection or complaint they could possibly conceive of. And what happens is, at the end of it, the people who wouldn't tell you the stuff they were worried about because they didn't want to hurt your feelings have shared that with you. The people who wouldn't shut up about the stuff that was bothering you with them because they didn't think you'd heard them have shared that with you. And you can say, now we've heard that, that's great. Um, and you have this pile of ideas that you can then take and further uh, evolve and or to further use to further evolve the ideas that you have. So those are great techniques for actually getting people involved with their system. Embedded in all of this is an assumption that I have, which is maybe or maybe not, which is that I think we have for too long been enamored of this idea of the genius designer, or design as this thing that some really cool person produces. I have to say, with respect, I think that's bullshit. I think design is a thing that anybody does, a guy does, a gal does, to actually take all of the ideas that everybody has about what a product can be and to bring them together in a way that creates an elegant, appropriate, cohesive solution for the end users. So that's, that's all the stuff about brainstorming and working with groups. The last step, I think, once you've done all this stuff, is you want to figure out what what ideas are the right ideas? At Adaptive Path, we, um, we 
we, again, using this kind of model, we think of this as a point where you move into the refining process and you're trying to get to the end. And the idea of the star setter, Shippai, is that when you're doing any of this kind of work, it's very choppy waters, and it is so damn easy to get uh, knocked about and sort of lose course. And so what you need is very high in the sky and clear objective that you're always charting yourself towards. And how do you do that? Well, historically, we have used business requirements to do that, and uh, I think, thankfully, companies have gotten really savvy in understanding that that's not really enough because business requirements, A, may not actually be very understanding of the user's perspective, but B, and sort of more importantly, they tend to be just lists of features and functionality. And features and functionality are really, really easy to copy. It's very hard to differentiate on that stuff over a long period of time. So, if the start and sale ship by is not requirements, what is it? Um, I think we are starting to understand that it aligns a little closer to user needs, and that is good. So, in the e-bike scenario, it will help us if we know that this person is curious about uh, how many people are going to bring friends, and should I invite the folks from work, and it's a BYOB party, and all that is good stuff. And if we can understand that and design solutions that address this person's questions, that is good. But even that, I would argue, is not enough. Because that just creates a productivity application. It just lets them do the stuff that they kind of want to do. I think that there's something about the products that we really love and use that transcends just productivity and transcends just features and functionality. And for that, I espouse using design principles. And design principles are pretty simple, actually. It's five to seven kind of pithy statements of what you want the experience of using your product to be. Examples. Okay. TiVo. TiVo's original design principles are this. It's entertainment, stupid. It's TV, stupid. It's video, damn it. Everything is smooth and gentle. No modality or deep hierarchy. Respect the viewer's privacy. And it's a robust appliance, like a TV. So these are funky statements, right? They're like a little bit full, they have a little personality, they don't really specifically address functionality, although they allude to it in some cases. And yet, there is a personality and a quality of experience that is embedded in these statements, these statements which existed long before the TiVo product existed. So when you think about, it's entertainment stupid, it's TV stupid, there's a sort of a reference, a cheeky kind of fun playfulness that is very similar to what you're seeing right here. And the feeling of everything being smooth and gentle, that's kind of what you're feeling when you're using that remote control and when you hear a little boop boop. Like, it's all built into the interface and every dimension in which the interface is meaningful for an end user. So those are some good design principles. Uh, Google Calendar has had design principles when they started designing it, which was fast, visually appealing, and joyous to use. Drop dead simple to get information into the calendar. More than boxes on a screen. Reminders, invitations, etc. Easy to share, so you can see your whole life in one place. And I think that's kind of what it feels like. It feels like there's a, a richness and a depth that's deeper than just boxes on a calendar. Your whole life in one place, I think there's an element of that. Drop dead simple, all of those things are, are not features, they're not functionality, but they are qualities of the experience that you have when you go into this application. So, in a nutshell, Design principles are a statement of what you want the essence of the experience to be. Um, do you guys know this word quiddity? It's a good Scrabble word. I love this word. It's basically, it's the essence of the thing. It's whatever the thing is at its sort of most core. And what I would argue is, the products that we love to use the most have strong quiddity. When I use Apple products, I feel creative. The essence of them is that. When I use Microsoft products, I feel productive. That is their essence. When I use TurboTax, I feel like I'm not going to get audited, and that is the quiddity of that product, which is a great thing. And I would say that you are not going to have a meaningful, tang tangible, pungent user experience unless you define the quiddity of that experience for yourselves. So, evite. Let's say we're designing evites quiddity. So, it can be helpful to actually start it based on stuff we already know. If they know that they have business needs that are around increasing registration, that's good information. If we know from the user's perspective that they just feel overwhelmed by the communications and they want help with that, that's good information. But ultimately, it should result in a statement that has a little more pungency. 
Make it addictive, for instance, is a way to support these problems while also making it feel like something. So if you want to increase registrations and you want to make people come back a lot so communications can happen within the system, making it addictive will encourage everyone associated with an event to keep coming back all the time, make sure they're registered and deeply involved in it, so they can be a part of that event as it's happening, before it's happening, after it's happening. That's a good example of a design principle. Um, so the cool thing about design principles is that once you have them, you can then go back through all of that work that you've done to come up with a lot of different ideas. And very quickly, the ideas that are most supportive of your design principles will uh, start to emerge. And the ones that aren't will sort of fall away. And it's a really good way for you to understand why you're making the decisions that you're making. And more importantly, most importantly perhaps, it's a really good way for you to say no to things that don't need to go on in your system. And that's hard because um, this is a situation that, uh, that I think many of us sort of struggle with, which is that you have somebody who comes to you and they sort of want something in the product. And it's very hard to say no because you kind of don't know why. Your gut tells you no, but you don't necessarily have better reasoning than that. And it's particularly hard to say no when that person who's coming to you is your boss or your boss's boss or your boss's boss's boss which happens all the time. But when you have really clear design principles, when you have a well-articulated statement of the liquidity of your system, then you're in a much better position to say, no, that's probably not going to help us achieve this experience, but let's talk about why we want that thing, and let's talk about how we can make it work given what we want this experience to be. So that's pretty key, I think, for getting us from stage two to stage three in the organization, frankly. All right, how are we doing on time? We're good, okay, so closing down. If any of this stuff is interesting to you, if you want to try this stuff at home, um, I think the sort of, the things you can do right away. One, you can start sketching right away. Uh, whether you use any of the techniques I've just described doesn't matter all that much to me. What matters is that you force yourself to sketch six ideas before you allow yourself to move forward with one of them. Second thing you can do is you can schedule some workshops it's great if they're sketchboard sessions or open design sessions or black hat sessions or whatever, but yeah, like invite people in. I think that is the core. Uh, and the third thing that you can do is draft some design principles. Uh, even if you don't share them with anybody, although you should, even if you don't, just having them yourself will help you to design with, uh, with a sort of a greater sense of your North Star. Um, and if uh, you're interested in going deeper with any of this stuff, we're actually doing a workshop in San Francisco in April, uh, which takes you from how to sketch to how to do sketchboards, to actually create a working interactive prototype in two days. So I have a uh, little cards if you're interested in doing that. And if you register with the code FOLB, you can get 15% off. Um, so yeah, so that's basically everything I wanted to share, but I think I'd like to end kind of on a note of just why it matters. Um, it matters, frankly, because of all you guys and because of your professional satisfaction. Um, we have the great fortune of being in a field where we can feel like we're kind of fighting the good fight and we're doing the good work and we're motivated by actually helping people. And not everybody can say that. That's a great thing to, to be able to say. But if you don't have strong ideas, the, the warmth in the heart cools very quickly. You lose faith in why you're doing it and what you're doing and that's what I was experiencing. So part of it is to help you guys just stay warm in the heart. But the other reason, I think, well, okay, so when I was talking about, when I first started talking about the team of one, I, I got some feedback that this wasn't really relevant because uh, we're all becoming specialists anyway and generalists are going away and it doesn't really matter. And I think that's, that's uh, well, I disagree, frankly. There are some specialists, there's still a lot of generalists. The, the thing is, there's specialists and generalists because our field is growing, frankly, because we are growing. And the reason that we're growing is because, well, a lot of reasons. It's because the web and uh, user experience have all finally fully established themselves as real concerns for companies who never thought that it would ever matter to them. And it's growing because, frankly, uh, people are learning how to build products in much lighter, faster, more agile ways. And as they're sort of churning out these products, they also need somebody who can help you churn out usable products. So we need user experience folks in lots of different places. And it's growing because companies are focusing on innovation and, 
and all these things sort of matter to them. And it's frankly, it's growing even in a downturn. It's not as bad as 2001. It's growing because people know that this actually makes a difference in the products that we use. But we won't be successful as a field. We won't win friends and allies if we don't have good ideas that we can sort of defend well and are well articulated. So that is why I give a damn about the team of one experience. And that is why, frankly, I think of myself as a team of one. I used to officially be one, and now I work with a whole bunch of designers. But I'm still a team of one, and I will always be a team of one. And I want you to think of yourselves the same way, which is why I have a call to arms for you folks. If you think of yourselves as teams of one, if you give a damn about user experience, I invite you all to join the cause of user experience team of one. I invite you to click this button and like that button and like that button. And um, just uh, you know, stand proud, raise the flag of the user experience team of one, everybody. Um, yeah, actually, uh, you, so they're doing podcasting, so I invite everyone to come to the mic with their questions, but gentlemen in the front, can you go ahead uh, and say it, and I can have either of you go to the mic. Okay. Hi, okay, I thought you had really good ideas about, you know, how to, how to make the ad hoc teams and work with people. Um, and they're, they're very great, but at least, like for me, I work remotely. Mm. Do we have any ideas about how to incorporate that with remote teams and people that are off location? Yeah, that's a challenge of it, for sure. We're, we're learning a bit more about that, actually. I think you have to have a good scanner, frankly, and uh, you have to um, make the time and sort of plan ahead to actually have these remote uh, sort of check-ins together. Um, I'm actually, I have two people in the audience who I work with remotely as clients, and they probably could speak to the experience of that, but it's, it's, it's not as easy as when you have people in the room. It's not as easy as when you can sort of stand up at a wall and point at things together, but if you can scan your sketches uh, and you can get them into software that you can all look at it together, there's a, there's a new product is it Concept Share? Is that what it's called? Yeah, there's a product called Concept Share that's just coming out of beta right now. It's actually a really great tool for sharing uh, creative artifacts, and it gives you the ability to comment right on the sketches and to replace sketches with wireframes and then visual design prompts. It lets you the evolution of the ideas as we go along. So you need to kind of look at tools like that. Um, I also think that. Um, I haven't done this yet, but I'm really interested in starting to use tablets to actually do live sketching of people kind of remotely. I know there's there are um, there's different software that will let you do that, and I actually need to do more research on it. But I was at a presentation at uh, BizThink last week, two weeks ago, where somebody was doing that. It's pretty amazing. Like I think there's something about being there when you see the idea start to kind of be created that uh, it's just like there's a different mapping in the brain or something. So I would look into tablet software, definitely look into concept share. Um, even if you don't do any of that, just get a good scanner and scan that stuff in and then be on the phone and talk through what you're, what you're looking at. Yeah, but it's harder for sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, I totally respect your approach in bringing many people into the kitchen and getting other perspectives, uh, as I think that solves part of the problem that I'd like to present you with. Um, but when you end up with really good wireframes and really strong UX ideas, and then you ultimately need to do that handoff to develop, mm -hmm. what what are your sort of ideas as to the fidelity that needs to be held to those kind of design ideas and wireframes and whatnot? The better you can articulate your point and your reasoning. Totally is going to help you out there. But in my work, I end up, our UX team, I think, is a little bit more pie in the sky, still working with it, not being collaborative enough. And we get these things, yeah. and it's like, really? This, that, the other thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. So, question. What do you do? Yeah. Um, I, I, I am sort of moving, we're not there all the way yet, ended up the path, but I'm moving towards thinking that wireframes are kind of a little bit obsolete at this point. I think you can go from sketches to interactive prototypes a lot more quickly than you ever used to be able to, given the tools that we have. And I think um, to the extent that you can give, to the extent that you can work with developers, and not give, that is a sort of, it feels a little icky to say that it's like, hey, now it's like throwing it over the wall. I do think it needs to be more collaborative, actually. But to the extent that you can work with developers to actually create the ideas in an interactive format that they can then use as a basis for Create a deeper interaction. I think there, it, it, it um, eliminates a lot of the 
decision. But with that said, I think that part of it is, is cultural too. I think you, cultural and organizational, it's really, really important to, to stay involved in the process beyond the end of the delivery of the wireframes. Like even if you're using wireframes, I think checking in with the development team regularly, not waiting for them to come to you with questions, and my god, if you can be co-located, that's even better. Like actually sitting there with them is, is nothing that's a replacement for that. So I, I think part of it is an attitudinal kind of organizational shift and just actually um, being more committed to staying involved in the process longer. Um, but I also think that we can, we can clarify a lot of the questions that we have about what, what did you really mean in the wireframes if we actually just make them interactive to start with. And I think that there are easier tools than we realize for that. Um, I really love prototyping by taking sketches and drawing more sketches and scanning them all and putting them in PowerPoints and then creating little hyperlinks in PowerPoint. I mean, it's it's like it's so dumb. It's not a real prototype in any way, but it at least demonstrates what the sort of the ideas are in a way that makes it more real for development folks. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think those are some ideas. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, first, I think it's actually one of the, the best panels I've seen so far here. So thank you. Thank you. I just thought it was really, really useful and informative. Um, I, I do want to ask you about a, a comment you made about um, the idea of the, like the lone genius or something like that being yeah. quote unquote uh, BS. Um, and I just wonder if you think it's completely impossible um, for that model of creativity um, to design the kind of products that you're talking about. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's not impossible, but it's a hell of a lot rarer than I think we would like to believe it is. I mean, I think we all got involved in this work because we all feel a little bit like the lone and genius on some level, right? Like that's sort of part of what makes us tenacious and makes us kind of want to fight, which is what makes us successful. But um, even people who can come up with really great pearls pretty regularly uh, cannot match a room full of minds that can sort of see things from lots of different dimensions all the time. So I do think that there are absolutely some genius designers in the field who are doing great work. But and, I, and frankly, I've worked with some of them. I mean, Jesse James Garrett is an amazing, amazing designer. Dan Saffer, really amazing designer. Those guys, they get better when they have other people helping them to see the flaws in their own ideas. Because what they do is they strengthen them even more. So I think, yes, there are folks like that, but I don't think it's ever a replacement for having kind of many minds. The idea of, of uh, bringing a team together to review all of these things is a great um, philosophy for work. A, it can be very expensive, so you have to be careful yeah. when you're doing those things. It can take longer. But um, I've read a number of papers that state that bringing a client into the process can also actually speed things up and be very helpful. But I never hear anybody talk about doing that or doing it. So I just yeah. wonder if you ever do that. Yeah, we do do that. And we've got folks in the audience who are representative of that right there. And uh, it's, it's, it's actually amazing. It's so much better than, uh, it's, it's the optimal situation, I would say. Uh, the reason for that is because if you bring the client into the process, they become participants in the process, and the ideas that come out of the process are as much, if not more, their ideas than yours, which actually help them to be good evangelists for them in their organizations once you're gone. And I, mean, I invite my, with my former clients to, have, you know, to share their opinions about that, but I think that the biggest risk to, to working as consultants actually is that you do this great work and then you leave and there's it's like it doesn't it doesn't stand on its own, doesn't tell its own story and you're absent. So having people in the organization who are owners and supporters of that to make that really live is is sort of nirvana for consulting, I think. Hi there. Um, in my experience I found out that the handoff process between design and development you know, in that process, or shortly thereafter, there are a lot of things that change pretty quickly. Yes. As people dig deeper into the requirements, look at the designs, and even if you bring those developers and stakeholders into the process early, you know, there are inevitable changes. So within your organization, how is that generally handled? Is it a formal process? Does it happen ad hoc? Or yeah. Um, it's, that's a good question. Uh, it's not a formal process in any way. I mean, I would say adaptive path, because we do consulting, each, it's different with each project. Sometimes we are involved 
uh, after the handoff period, the kind of oversight relationship where we'll be checking in pretty regularly and as designs are being implemented, questions will come up about like, well, okay, this isn't something we planned for, what do we do, how do we make it consistent, and, um, and, and then it's just, you work together in a kind of ad hoc fashion. That's the case where just having design principles and having just sort of patterns and principles established will help you because then you can, you can say, well, like, there's a lot of ways we could address this problem, but what will keep us closest to the spirit of the user experience? Um, but yeah, and sometimes we're, we're just not. Sometimes we sort of go away, and then it's like you you come back later, six months later, and it's pretty different. And that makes it a lot harder, I think, to actually keep things uh, kind of close to close to the middle. Um, I think in general. We work with clients who work in all kinds of different development processes, but people who do a, sort of more of an agile development, I think they're just so much better off in this respect because there's there's so many check-in points all along the way to be saying like, okay, question, what do we do with this? Question, what do we do with this? How do we evolve this thing? I just think it's like it's just it's, in my view, it's proving itself to be the much more realistic way of actually doing this kind of work. So I, if, if you can work that way, I think that makes it a lot easier. But if you're in an organization that doesn't work that way, if it's a much more waterfall kind of organization, simply um, having enforced regular sort of check-ins. Like, hey, let's, let's talk every Friday afternoon. Any questions come up this week? I think that can be helpful too. Um, are, we, is there, are we right at, we are right at 11, so I'll let you all go. But um, thank you so much for getting up early to come see